right, so we're starting with question 11 and if you haven't seen the other 10 questions, then you can check out my previous video. I'll leave it in the description box below. So uh, in this question, we're given the equation and we're given the equilibrium constant for concentration, which in this case is 280. So what they're asking for is the concentration of sulfur trioxide. And in order to do that, we need to remember the equation um, in order to find the equilibrium constant for concentration. So Kc is equal to the product, so SO3, or the concentration of the product, over the concentration of the reactants. So SO2 times oxygen. Now there's two of SO2, so in this case it's going to be squared. If there was three, uh, the coefficient was three, then it would be cubed. And then the same thing for sulfur trioxide, it's going to be squared. Now what we're going to do is uh, rearrange this in order to make sulfur trioxide the subject of the formula. So it's going to look like this. So you're going to move this to the other side, so you're going to multiply. Okay, so in order to get rid of that squared, I'm just going to have to do the square root of this. And then all we have to do now is substitute the values which they gave us, and that is Kc is 280. Sulfur uh, dioxide's concentration is 0 0.2 squared times the concentration of oxygen, which is 0 0.1. And then if you place that in your calculator, you'll end up getting 1.058 moles per decimeter cubed. And the only option that has this answer is A. Okay, so for question 12, we're trying to find the oxide that will increase the pH when added to water. So basically pH increases when the amount of H plus ions decreases or the amount of OH ions or hydroxide ions are increasing. So when pH is increasing, that means that the solution becomes more alkaline. So when magnesium oxide is added to water, you get magnesium hydroxide. And it's not very soluble in water. However, when it does dissociate in water, you end up with OH minus. So you're increasing that and that's a good thing. So that's a check for now. And then for B, when you mix alum aluminum oxide with water, you end up with aluminum hydroxide. And some sources say that there is no reaction. Um, but then that's because they're saying that aluminum oxide is not uh, soluble in water, but it is soluble in strong acids and bases. So the oxide ions, so in this case, for example, it's held really strongly. So in the solid lattice, that's why it does not react with water. So here, you know, aluminum has a three plus charge. So it's a lot stronger than the magnesium, which is only a two plus charge. So apparently it holds it very strongly and so it doesn't really dissociate in water. Now, um, this is silica, I believe, and it's basically a covalent, it forms a covalent network and it's pretty strong, like the covalent bonds there are held very strong-like. And so when, it, when you react it with water, you end up with this and this doesn't dissolve well in water. And first of all, it just doesn't dissolve well in water and you have hydrogen in this case and we're trying to get less of the H plus and more of the OH and then for the last one so these two are out and then for the last one uh, sulfur dioxide when you react it with water you end up with sulfurous acid which um, once you know once it dissociates it's just basically H plus ions and or this poly atomic ion and well, we're increasing the H plus ions and we don't want that. We want less of it or more of the hydroxide ion. So the only one that actually does that is A. So A is your answer. So for question 13, we're trying to find the elements X, Y, and Z. And in all four options, they're all consecutive. So we can't rule anything out just yet. But they told us that Y, which is the one in the middle, has the highest first ionization energy and the lowest melting point. So. A general rule of thumb is that as you go across the periodic table, so just imagine this is the periodic table, melting point should increase. That's because the radius decreases in size, so 
atomic radius decreases. And so the force of attraction should be stronger. And so um, it will need more energy in order to you know, actually melt that specific element. So in general, you can use Coulomb's law and basically states that um, the force of attraction is inversely proportional to the radius. So if the radius um, increases, or in our case, because we're going from left to right, so it's decreasing, right? Then force of attraction should increase. However, there are some exceptions. So for example, silicon right now, it's a giant covalent structure. So giant covalent structure. And it has a very high melting point, much higher compared to phosphorus and sulfur. C is out because in this case, they're saying you should have the lowest melting point when silicon has the highest. And so we continue now. So basically phosphorus is a solid and so is sulfur, but um, in their normal structure, phosphorus is actually P4 and sulfur is S8. And they're both simple molecular compounds. And they form simple covalent bonds. Or the reason why elements actually end up losing an electron or gaining an electron is in order to be stable. So when an atom is actually either all unpaired or all paired electrons, it is stable or considered stable. So for example, silicon is considered stable because all of its outer electrons are unpaired. And you know, to get an octet, you need eight electrons. In phosphorus, there's five electrons, and in sulfur, there's um, six. Now, the reason why phosphorus will end up having a higher first ionization energy than sulfur is because even though we said that as you go to the right, radius should decrease, and so force of attraction should be greater, and that means more energy is going to be needed to you know, um, get rid of these electrons, it's just because there's something called electron pair repulsion. So you have these pairs here, so electron pair repulsion, because you know how they're like uh, charges and like charges repel. So in this case, phosphorus will end up having the highest first ionization energy. And of course, you don't have to go through all of this because you have the, what's it called? You have the formula sheet and it does state the first ionization energy for all the elements. And you're going to realize that phosphorus has the highest compared to sulfur and of course, Oh, and another reason as to why phosphorus will end up having a lower melting point compared to sulfur is because, well, it's P4, so that means there's less electrons, there are less, um, there's a lower amount of London dispersion forces or van der Waal forces. And so, you know, again, less energy is needed to break these bonds. So your answer would end up being D. So for question 14, we're trying to find the metal in this metal nitrate. So we were told that the metal nitrate is a group 2 and hydrous group 2 metal. So there's we have a 5 gram sample of it. It loses 3.29 grams and so the metal oxide of it would be 1.71 grams. So this is actually the formula or the equation, sorry, that you're supposed to know. And this is basically the thermal decomposition of a group 2 metal. You should also know the ones for the group 1 metal. So this is for group 2. You should also know for the group one as well. So we have this. This is the five gram sample and then it lost 3.29, but you wonder why. And that's because these are gases. So it's a gas and a gas. And this is a solid and this is a solid. So these two will fly off the reaction vessel. And so you end up with this. And this is your 1.71 grams right here. We have this little triangle that can help us with formulas, and that is number of moles is equal to the mass, which is in grams, divided by the molar mass, right? So the molar mass of the nitrate ion is going to be 2 because we have coefficient, so 2 times 14, which is the mass number of nitrogen plus 16 times three, which is 48, because you have three um, oxygens, right? Of two, sorry, this two is actually not from here, it's from here. Because you know, when you're trying to write 
the formula of a compound, you're going to look at this here two and here one. You're going to cross over here. So the two goes down to the nitrate. The one is going to go to the X, but of course we don't write out the one. So we have this two here. We have two nitrate ions and their molar mass is going to equal to 124 grams. So the molar mass of the whole metal nitrate is going to be, well, we don't know the mass of X, right? We're just gonna say it's X, right? So, so the molar mass of this is going to be X plus 124 grams. And then the molar mass for the metal oxide is going to be X plus 16 oxygen's mass number is 16 and you can get the mass number from the periodic table and mass number is just the proton number plus the neutron number so the number of moles of metal nitrate is the same as the number of mole of metal oxide since it's a two to two or you can simplify it and it becomes a one to one ratio so that would mean we can make use of that so the number of moles is mass over molar mass so the mass that we were using or we were given of this sample is five over the molar mass of the metal nitrate, which is X plus 124, should give you moles, right? And it's the same number of moles as this. And we found the grams or the mass of it, which is 1.71 over X plus 16. Now we're just gonna solve for X. So you're going to cross multiply, so five, x plus 16 is equal to 1.71 times x plus 124. Now we're just going to expand the brackets. So you're going to end up with 5x plus 80 equal to 1.71x plus 212.04. Move the x here, the 1.71x here. You're going to end up with 3.29x. Move the 80 there, so 212, or 212.04 minus 80, which gives you 132.04. Now X, you're gonna divide both sides by 3.29, and it's approximately, or it gives you 40.134, which is approximately 40. And if, if you search the periodic table, you're gonna find out that the element with the molar mass of 40 is calcium or the mass number of 40 is calcium. So then X is actually calcium and your answer would be B. All right, so for question 15, we have a solution that contains magnesium ions and another solution that contains uh, barium ions. So we're trying to find out which one will result in more precipitate when you're adding the sodium sulfate and which one will add more precipitate when you add sodium hydroxide. So this is something that you're supposed to actually know, um, and that is the, the trend, uh, the solubility trend of the hydroxide and sulfate down the group two elements. So as you go down group two, the solubility of the group two metal sulfate will end up decreasing. So it won't be as soluble. And then for the metal hydroxide, it will increase as you go down the group. Well, knowing that now, we know that for the first test, you're going to end up with a greater amount of precipitate with, uh, with the barium ion because as you go down the group again, the solubility of the metal sulfate decreases. And so basically we're gonna have more precipitate with the barium two plus ion. And for this one, it's going to be the opposite. So more precipitate with the magnesium ion because as you go down, the solubility ends up, ends up increasing. So that means at the top of the group, the solubility of the metal hydroxide is not as great, but as you keep going down, it will increase, and then opposite for the metal sulfate. So the only option that gave that is B. All right, so for question 16, um, this is a trend you also need to know, and that is volatility decreases as you go down the group, you know, the halide group. So volatility decreases. So you notice that fluorine and chlorine, which are at the top of the group, are gases, and then bromine's a liquid, and then iodine, and all the other ones below it are solids. So that's how you know that volatility is actually decreasing. So that just rules out option A and B. So the more volatile one would be chlorine. So we have now C and D. Now, in order to find out 
the reason behind it, well, first of all, bromine has more electrons, so the chance of an induced dipole happening actually increases. So, for example, it's not polar, right? It's not a polar molecule. These uh, diatomic molecules are not polar, so Cl2, Br2, you know, they're not polar because there's no difference in electronegativity. However, electrons do move around. And so at one point, they can be all on this side, so you get a delta a negative charge or an induced dipole and then a delta positive on this side, or it could be the opposite. So when they attract or there's more, you know, bromine molecules, you have this little attraction here. And it's a lot stronger than between chlorine molecules because, well, there's just more electrons, so that means that overall charge could be a lot greater than compared with a chlorine. And um, also with bromine molecules, because they're in a period below the chlorine, that means they have an extra radius according to Bohr's model. And because of that, that means that the electrons are further away. So we have these, you know, radius or radii and the electrons are further away from the nucleus. So that means that force of attraction between them isn't as great, it's, it's a lot weaker. So again, the electrons are just more free to move around. And so you end up with a stronger induced dipole. And that is why C is your answer. Okay, so for question 17, we have sodium azide, and they said it reacts similarly to the chloride ion. So when we're testing for chlorine, this is something that you're supposed to know. And so the equation, or the, yeah, the equation would look something like this. And then if this is completely balanced out. So the reason this is correct is not that silver is three plus, but in fact, it's just plus. So the uh, charge of it is just positive one. So here's a positive one, negative one, cross them like this. So you're gonna have a one here and a one here, but we don't consider, or we just don't write the one. So it just stays like that. Okay, so we have that now, and then they said they're adding aqueous ammonia, and when you're adding aqueous ammonia to silver chloride or silver azide, or yeah, you'll end up with this complex and the ion on its own, and that is basically um, capable of dissolving, and you end up with a colorless solution. You should remember this from your IGCC time, so the ion test and the solubility rules. So make sure you know this before um, actually doing or writing your exams. Uh, so yeah, I forgot to mention that A would be your answer. All right, so in this question, solid um, ammonium sulfate is heated with excess sodium hydroxide solution. So this is what the equation would look like. I wrote out the um, equation for you and I balanced it out. So ammonium, it, has a positive one charge and sulfate has a two minus charge again cross so the two comes here and then one is there so if you've noticed that the ammonium ion and the hydroxide ion are the ones that are actually reacting and then the sodium ion and the sulfate are spectator ions they're there but they're not really reacting they're not changing so if you notice the ammonium is donating an h plus right a proton or hydrogen ion to the hydroxide. And the hydroxide is then accepting it. So you end up with an H2O and an NH3. When something like this happens, when this sort of transaction occurs, that means that it's an acid-base reaction. So acid-base reaction, which is also known as a neutralization reaction which usually involves the formation of water, but that's not always the case. So option A is the only one that says it's an acid-base reaction. For B, it says a precipitate, it's a precipitation. There's no precipitate here that forms. You have an aqueous solution, you have gas and you have a liquid. Um, all sodium ions or most sodium ions are um, soluble. And it's not a redox reaction. So redox is when reduction and oxidation occur. So redox has both of them. And you can remember it through oil rig, which is oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons. And there's no thermal decomposition. 
nothing's being broken down to its original elements. So A is your answer. For question 19, catalytic converters, they get rid of toxic gases, so like carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, that's why I placed an X because it could be any form of nitrogen oxide, and hydrocarbon vapor. So they do that by converting it to a less hazardous gas like carbon dioxide, water vapor, so water is a gas form, and nitrogen. So which is the one that causes acid rain and is filtered out? or is removed from the core exhaust fumes by a catalytic converter. That would be nitrogen dioxide because nitrogen dioxide is removed, forming nitrogen, and when it reacts with water in, or rain, it forms uh, an acid rain. So nitric acid, which is, well, an acid, and thus acid rain. And so D is your answer. All right, so for question 20 and the last question for this video, we have trichloroethene. So ethene, that means it's an alkene, so there's a double bond. Trichlor means there's three chlorines, so it looks like this. We're trying to find which substance will react with trichloroethene to give us a chiral product. The chiral product is formed from a type of stereoisomerism called optical isomerism. So when you have the product, they're basically superimposed they're basically mirror images of each other. So you're gonna end up with a carbon like this attached to four different uh, elements or compounds. So I'm just gonna use A, B, D, and E to say that they're different. And the only one that would actually do that would end up being uh, bromine. So if you add bromine here, open up or break down the double bond, you'll end up with this. You have this one. Uh, let me just fix that chlorine. Now you have the mirror image of it, so CCL2 and then Br right here, bromine right here, and hydrogen. So here they're in mirror images. They're not, they look similar, but they're not exactly the same. So I'm going to show you what it looks like when I just open this up to make it a little easier for you to understand. So there's bromine right here, chlorine, hydrogen, and bromine. So I'm going to take this carbon as the main one, not this one. You can't use this one because it has two of the same, which are chlorine and chlorine. And we don't want that. We said that they have to be different. So this is going to be the main carbon. So we placed it here. And then this is this part, which is carbon, two chlorines, and a bromine. So basically, a is your answer, it's the only one that can give you this superimposed image. Everything else or all the other products just can't. So for example, HCl, NaCN, and NaOH all don't give us the answer that we're looking for. So that is it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.